When I look in your eyes, you make me feel so alive. God's the love. Coming to me, coming to me. You make me feel like a new me. Hey, this is Jordan Patrice, and you're listening to 98.4 FM. WPIR, the Godzilla station. WPR 98.4 FM is your boy. And we, as I, as I promised, you know what I'm saying? We here. We got Miss Marcy as my special co host. And as I said, I was going to work on it and make it happen for the listeners. We have Dr. Umar Johnson in the building. How you doing, my brother? Peace and love, my brother. Good evening to you as well as to your listening audience. It's an honor to be on the show. Now, it's an honor to have you, man. Yeah. Man, I had some technical difficulties on my phone. I arrived here in Rochester, New York, and uh, all of a sudden... My functionality to be able to call or receive messages shut down. So I don't know if that's FBI, but I've never heard of that ever with a cell phone, not being able to call or receive calls. But that's what I'm going through right now with this iPhone. So God willing, we'll work that out. But I'm glad we was able to get get the call through. Oh, well, you know, whatever it had to do to make it work, as long as we got it to work, that's all that matters. (laughs) Yes, sir. All right, so... You know, I know you're a busy man, so we're going to try to, you know, keep it brief, you know, and so you can handle your business because you have a strong mission that we like for the people to see and to understand that, you know, when it comes to you and what you're trying to um, project to the to the people, you know, we want everybody to have a better, clear, a better understanding of the situation at hand. All right. Yes, sir. All right, so now, um, you know, we did some research on you and everything. Well, I've been researching you for the last nine some odd years, you know. So I've been following you very strong. I know y'all saw it in the letter that I wrote to your website. Um, I might have saw it. I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, I see so much stuff. I don't know. Yeah, so, um, so you're from Philadelphia, right? Yes. So how was it growing up in Philadelphia? Growing up in Philadelphia was, you know, it was all right. Regular childhood. Uh, You know, I went to public school, grew up in the hood. My parents, they weren't rich, but they did the best that they could for us. I enjoyed my childhood for the most part. Went away to residential military school for high school my last four years, ninth through 12th. Uh, but childhood was uh, it was a good experience to me for the most part. The same bumps and bruises, good times, you know, and great times that I guess most young black men growing up experience. True. True. So you said you went to military school. What was that experience like? Well, it was a predominantly black school, believe it or not, because many of the white parents had pulled their kids out once the black children started attending. So the school ended up being 85% black, but the staff was 99% white. Uh, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, Scotland School for Veterans Children. It probably wouldn't be classified legally as a fully military academy, but it was clearly a paramilitary academy. The school was run off of a military protocol. We had mandatory JROTC. Uh, we had JROTC classes. We had to wear military uniforms uh, two, three times a week. So I call it a military school, but uh for legal purposes the state department of education may classify it as a para military school which is not quite military but just about um it it, it was an interesting experience it taught me white racism up close um mm. it, it it taught me the, the threatening manner in which white authority often views uh, young black males young black uh, ch- uh children in particular in general uh, we wasn't allowed to wear the box hair cuts. They made us cut the box hair. Anything we did to try to add some uniqueness or style uh, to our social code was met with resentment. Uh, when we, I had the tallest box in the school. My box was like kid and play box. <laughs> they made me cut it down. They, they, they had this little rubric. They said your hair couldn't be more than, I don't know, one or two inches tall. Um, then we had to get the, sh- the uh, shags, the gummies. They made us cut those. We wore the Malcolm X T-shirts. I think they said something about the Malcolm X T-shirts. Every little thing we did, you know, culturally or socially, they just tried to stop it, not even understanding it. So 
they wanted to throw me out because I didn't pledge the flag. Uh, because it was a paramilitary academy, they felt that it was an extreme contradiction to have a student attend who did not pledge the flag. But having been raised a Sunni Orthodox Muslim, my father, he didn't allow us to pledge the flag. And one day in auto shop, the auto shop teacher, Mr. Ott, he saw that I wasn't pledging the flag. He called the administration. I was sent to the office. Uh, they told me that I might end up being kicked out of the school. But then they found out that since the school was publicly funded by the Pennsylvania State Department of Military Affairs, it was a publicly funded school, they could not kick me out because federal court has already affirmed years ago that you cannot make any child in America say the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, can you do me a favor? Can you enlighten our listeners about your mission, you know, give them more info on your mission? Because as I was telling people about this interview, there's still a lot of people that didn't know who you were. Right. Well, I'm not surprised at that, only because I, I, I hadn't, I have yet to be invited on some of the mainstay media outlets in America, the mainstreams, the Oprah Winfrey shows, that kind of thing. Uh, I was on time joining, but it wasn't for long. Um, so because a lot of the mainstream media outlets that most Americans and black folk included tend to become accustomed to some of the uh, movers and shakers in this society, I I've never been invited on those uh, mediums yet. So. I'm not surprised that there's not a lot of folk who don't know me. I always say I'm surprised at the amount of folk who do know me, and I'm also surprised at the amount of folk who don't know me. In fact, people who I don't think should know who I am because they're not necessarily within the conscious community, they might know who I am, which is shocking. And then I come across people who are uh, conscious or politically astute who may not know who I am. So I'm shocked on both ends. I meet people in the middle of nowhere who know exactly who I am, and then I meet people who may be from Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, Detroit, Brooklyn, Houston, and have never heard of me. But I'm a doctor of clinical psychology. I'm a school psychologist, a certified school principal, political scientist. I'm a blood relative of Frederick Douglass, author of the book Psychoacademic Holocaust, The Special Education and ADHD Wars Against Black Boys. And as a school psychologist, my job is to serve as the gatekeeper of special education, I test children. I'm a tester. I give the assessments, the evaluations, IQ tests, achievement tests, emotional tests, psychological tests, adaptive behavior tests, visual motor tests. I'm the test man, as all school psychologists are. And I decide, based on my testing and my results and my impressions, as to whether or not I think a child can learn in a regular class or not. And if they can't, I send them to special ed. And if they can, I send them back to the regular classroom. I also evaluate mentally giftedness in children as well. I also provide school psychological counseling for children who have emotional issues that are affecting their ability to learn in school. My crusade is twofold. Uh, number one, to educate our parents and community about how special education and disruptive behavior disorder diagnoses, the most popular of which is ADHD, I'm on a crusade to make sure our people understand exactly how these two things are being used as weapons of mass destruction, which is marginalizing an entire generation of black boys and significantly undermining the black family. In addition to ADHD and special ed, you have school expulsion, you have high stakes testing, you have uh, white racism in public schooling. There's just so many issues when you deal with public school, but my job is to help wake the parents up. Special ed and ADHD, without question, are the top two issues that I'm trying to raise consciousness about. And, and I'm doing that through the National Independent Black Parent Association. Uh, this weekend in Rochester on s Sunday at the Frederick Douglass Resource Center, we will be organizing the Rochester chapter of the National Independent Black Parent Association. But we're organizing chapters all across the country and all across the world because parents need to get organized. We've never had a major black movement led by parents. We've never had that. And so I'm trying wow. to usher that in, not for history's sake, but because it's necessary. And, and the other piece is the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey RBG International Leadership Academy, which will be America's first residential academy for black boys based on the principles of entrepreneurship and revolutionary pan-Africanism. We're trying to raise $2 million to acquire the St. Paul's College in Lawrenceville, Virginia. We've raised just over one-half million. We still have $1.5 to go. 
So we're asking everyone to please, please, please help us raise this money, help us with these donations, checks, money orders, and online uh, offerings, which can be made at GoFundMe.com forward slash Dr. Umar. Okay. All right. Now, Dr. Umar, I wanted to ask you, um, as you mentioned, um, the Academy School, why is your mission to uplift um, African-American boys? Well, when we look at white supremacy and how it chokeholds the progress of black people in this country, there's no population within the African-American contingency or constituency that is more oppressed, dejected, marginalized, and marked for extermination in the black male, which makes perfect sense from a militaristic standpoint, because whenever you want to subdue a population, you must subdue the defense, and the defense has always been the male. Not to say that sisters right. cannot fight, but largely speaking, men are not threatened by females. Men are threatened by other men. So in order to, right. to, 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 to lay low the black community, you have to destroy its strongest and most ardent defender, and that is the black male. So until right. we fix the black male, we cannot fix the rest of the community. And on top of that, the reason why building the school is so critically necessary is because you cannot change the trajectory of a people until you change the mental conditioning of that people, which is to say that black people have been largely, deeply, ingrained, thoroughly conditioned by white supremacy to work against our own best interests. We're the only species on earth that works against its own best interests. You cannot find an animal, you cannot find a fish, you cannot find a plant, you cannot find a fruit or a vegetable that will work against its best interest. There's no living species on earth that goes out of its way to self-destruct like the African because we have been engineered to do so. So if we want to fix the economic, political, cultural, social, familial condition in which black people find themselves, we must first change the mindset, change the mental paradigm. We must change the psychology of of the Negro in order for the African to be born. So the mind is the first frontier. No right. institution, no system, no process that we build will sustain itself if the mind of the African is not invested in its own best interests. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I actually, I figured that's what your reason was, but I wanted our listeners to hear you say that. Yes, because I've had people question why the school? You know, I get the emails. Not often. Most people understand why the school first, but some people would ask, well, why not start with a military? Why not start with an economic system? And the answer to all of that is anything you build before you fix the mind of the African to support it will fail because black people are not naturally, okay, or should I say are not unnaturally interested in seeing black progress. We work against black progress. So if you open up a multi-million dollar black strip mall or, or, or galleria, it'll have a for sale sign on it within a year or two because black people are still going to go and shop at the white mall because they've been trained to believe that anything white people do is better than if it's done by a black person. And we've seen this happen. I've seen it in Philadelphia. We had an all-black supermarket closed down in a couple years, repossessed by the Puerto Ricans, and now they're doing excellent with the same business. Why is it that the Puerto Ricans can do so well with the same supermarket, but when the black man had the supermarket, it didn't do well because black people are not interested in buying black. Our self-hatred extends to every activity and human endeavor under the sun. So that self-hate affects our schooling. Why don't we already have enough independent black schools for black children? Lord knows we gross enough, uh, enough national product, enough capital, enough earning for every black child in America to have their own education. In fact, just our Christmas money, sacrificing our Christmas dollars in December, would generate enough revenue to build every black child in America an independent reality. Why don't they have it? Because black people are not interested in freeing their children from psychological slavery to the European public school system. We know the schools don't work. We know only one out of every four black boys is graduating. We know our girls are only being prepared for poverty, but we would rather buy shoes, hair, cars, and go on expensive vacation than take care of our own best interests. And this is where 
post-traumatic slavery disorder and understanding it is so critical. And on October 4th in Harlem, New York, I've been invited to really go in depth with this post-traumatic slavery disease syndrome. PTSD and slavery, at its most basic and simplistic level, condition black folk to not be interested in their future, period. During slavery, the only person who you were interested in, the only person's well-being that mattered was the slave master and his family. That was it. You were not expected to be concerned about your child, yourself, the next African next to you. Your sole purpose for existence was for the comfort of white folk. Here we are, 150 years later, celebrating the sequent centennial of our freedom, 150 years, 1865-2015. So this is our sequent centennial. Okay, and we're still only interested in looking out for the best interests of white folk. The things that black people need, we do not build them, even though we have the ability to. Wow. <laughs> How do you follow up behind that? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I do want to ask you this, uh, Dr. Umar. What are your thoughts on young men who walk around with their pants sagging? Because we see a lot of that. Yes. I was just asked that question on the panel discussion the other day. Here's my response. Two things. Number one, the sagging culture is an outgrowth of the glamorization and proliferation of mass incarceration. Years ago, back in the 80s and in the 90s, when the sagging really began to kick in, it took place because when black men went to jail, the first type of clothing that they used in jail before they went to the jumpsuit was the rubber pants, particularly in juvenile incarceration. When you're juvenile, when you, you formerly in juvenile incarceration centers, they would give you the pull-up of blue dicky type pants, and they had rubber in the waist. In jail, as well as in juvenile placement, you are not allowed to have a belt because you can use a belt as a weapon of suicide or right. a weapon of homicide. You could choke yourself to death. You could choke someone else to death. So they use rubber in the pants. As you know, rubber doesn't last long. So after right. a couple of weeks, the rubber gives way or it pops. And so you then had to walk around the jail or walk around a juvenile incarceration center holding up your pants because so many black men have been incarcerated and because so many black youth have been adjudicated as juveniles, that culture of sagging pants via not being able to have a belt began to expand itself outside of the prison walls and became a normal part of the subculture. So we really wouldn't have sagging pants as an issue if we didn't have mass incarceration. So the sagging pants is a symptom. It is not the cause. And one of the issues that we have to always be aware of in the black community is how a lot of times we pay more attention to the symptoms than to the cause. The pants is a symptom of the mass incarceration complex that has simply uh, 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 been drafted or acculturated into the general social milieu of the black community. The other issue that has to be raised here, it also speaks to the lack of employment for black males and young black and, and, and black youth. Now, when you have a job, you're expected to dress a certain way at the job. No job is going to have you with your pants sagging. No job, just about. But when you have the most difficult time of finding employment in the United States, which is the case for black males, okay, young and old, okay, America isn't interested in hiring us. Private white capital isn't interested in hiring us. Even the public sector is not interested in hiring us. So when you don't have anything to do, you're not as concerned about the way you look. In fact, you will intentionally mm -hmm. dress in a way that goes against the social custom because you recognize that you do not fit within the social structure. So if I do not fit within the social structure, why am I going to dress as if I am accepted in the social structure? So I'm not wearing a dress shirt. I'm not wearing a suit. I'm not wearing a tie. I'm not wearing a belt. And when I do wear my hat, I'm going to wear my hat backwards. Everything that I do is going to be in direct contradiction to the way society wants me to be because society has rejected me. So when people say, what can we do to get our boys to pull our pants up, give them a job. They will have no choice but to pull their pants up. In fact, I know that because I used to run the job placement program for black and Latino youth in Philadelphia years ago. And some of the same brothers on the corner with the pants sagging, hats back with the minute Dr. Umar was able to give them a job. And this was a minimum wage job, mind you which only shows how much our children want to do right but aren't often given the opportunity. But the minute Dr. Umar gave them 
their little 30, 20 hour a week minimum wage job. They pull their pants up, they turn their hat around, they start caring about the way that they dress. So again, the dressing is a symptom. The cause is mass incarceration and economic castration. Stop putting them in jail and find them jobs and the pants will come up on their own. Right. So it's kind of like some cause and effect. Exactly. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. How do you feel about the statistics showing that the African-American household is the highest rate in single parents? Well, that makes sense from a white supremacist perspective, because the war on black men has simply liquidated brothers out of the hood. I mean, the, the, the mass incarceration war, which is nothing but the new form of slavery or slavery on steroids is literally stripping the black community of its men. It's stripping the women of their husbands and it's stripping the fathers, the children of their fathers. So when you look at the fact that one out of every three African-American men is under some form of supervision from the criminal justice system, if they're not flat out incarcerated, because most of them are flat out incarcerated, but even the ones that are not flat out incarcerated, you know, who are ex-offenders maybe out on parole, you know, or probation, you know, you can be bussed back to jail simply for missing one of your meetings with your probation officer. So right. when you have a war, a deliberate war that seeks to criminalize every black man walking, literally every black man walking, you know, we should expect to see that the rates of family are going to go down because there's not enough available men for the sisters to get married to. Right. I agree. Now, you have two daughters, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, what are some of the things that you try to instill in them? Well, my youngest daughter, you know, she's not old enough to understand the politics of racism just yet, although she's okay. very bright in getting there. The issue with them is making them understand what it is they're going to have to face as black women in this society. And, of course, with sisters, the biggest challenge is for the standard of beauty. As a yeah. principal in the schools, I noticed that the major challenge faced by black girls is not suspension, is not expulsion, is not ADHD, is not special ed, because most of those things that I just named are 85% male. With the girls, it's for their standard of beauty. It's the fact that they're constantly being bombarded with lessons and images of beauty that are totally Eurocentric in fashion. And so for black girls, I see that one of the biggest things I'm going to focus on when we open up the Anna Douglas and Amy Garvey Academy is trying to rescue them from the self-hate and low self-esteem that comes from constantly being told that you have to look like a white woman in order to be attractive. And in fact, I often challenge black women to uh, study that and look at that uh, within themselves because you often hear black women and I agree with them, uh, express discontent over the fact that so many black men would, ma would rather marry outside their race. And I totally agree. I do not condone interracial marriage for black folk in any way, shape, or form. But at the same time, I often caution sisters that they have to address their own contradiction because many black women believe that looking white is what's attractive. I mean, look at Beyonce. She's probably the most successful black singer we've seen in the past generation, and we've never seen her natural hair. We have never seen Beyonce's natural hair. Every single time she performs is with a white woman's blonde wig on her head. And so we got to recognize how even rich and successful black women who are considered strikingly beautiful are still insecure about their own natural hair, insecure about their own lips, their own nose. I mean, look at the rate of black women who are getting physical surgery, nose surgery, lip surgery, all types of surgery to try to look like something other than what they are. So in order to rescue the psyche of the black woman, we're going to have to rescue her standard of beauty. Mm -hmm. I liked when the young lady from the 12 Years of Slavery, I can't pronounce her name, but you, you know who I'm talking about, the uh, yeah. black. Yeah, I liked when they held her up, of her, you know, her beauty, and they showed she was one of the most beautiful people in the world because she is beautiful. Oh, drop dead gorgeous. Drop yes. dead gorgeous. And that is the original beauty. And for yes. me, and this is one thing I try to teach the young uh, African princesses that I come across. That look that the sister from 12 Years a Slave had, that blue-black-purple skin, that nappy hair, you know, that beautiful smile, that shining white teeth, that is the original phenotype of the African. When God first put woman on earth, because woman was here before man, when God first put woman on earth, that's what she looked like. So that is what God considered beautiful, because that is what God made mankind. That is what God made womankind. So it's amazing how the most beautiful African woman would consider herself the ugliest. 
You see, and this is what white supremacy does. It takes reality and turn it totally upside down, where right becomes wrong, wrong becomes right, ugly becomes beautiful, and beautiful mm -hmm. becomes ugly. But unfortunately, I have to put out uh, put out the point that the sister from 12 Years a Slave is dating a white man, which oh. unfortunately takes away from all of that authentic African beauty, the fact that she's sleeping with a European. But, you know, that, that again, oh, wow. is traumatic slavery disease. You know, um, speaking on the you know the female, here's a here's a scenario. I talk to the females about you, you know, try to get them to understand your point of views and stuff like that. Now, some of them tend to not feel what you're saying, but like, you know, on your views, like how can uh, how can the black sisters get a bigger picture of your views without actually trying to make it seem like you're directing it to them personally? Well, I would probably say it's only a minority of black women who take that position. I mean, most of my work as an educator and as a school psychologist fighting for our children is with black mothers. It's with women because the fathers, again, are under attack. So when you look at my support base, the people who support me, most black women support Dr. Umar Johnson. They're the ones making the contributions you know, to the school. They're the ones that are supporting me with the different initiatives and things that I undertake. So I think that uh, the conscious media and the mainstream media has exaggerated the extent to which black women take an issue with me. I get nothing but love and support from black women. I mean, globally, too, not just in America, but around the world. So I think they are a minority. The problem is they're very loud. And so whenever a minority of people becomes very loud, they can look like they're representing the general attitude of their particular population, which is not the case. Um, when it comes to black women, obviously they take issue with the fact that I believe that they should be natural. Some sisters do. Uh, most do not. Okay. They also take issue uh, with feminism, my position on feminism, which is a white woman's movement that was basically used to infiltrate the black community, use black women for the numerical strength and intellectual ability, and at the same time turn them against black men. See, feminism, you know, has to be understood by black women. And I see so many young sisters coming out of college, going into college, who are boldly proclaiming they're feminists, and they know nothing about the history. They don't know that the mothers of feminism were white racist females who care nothing about black women. You know, they don't recognize that there's a separate movement, an African womanist movement, that does allow black women to uh, correct the contradictions that black men may actually espouse in the community. We do have some sexism in the black community, and African womanism can address that. African womanism says, I can challenge my man and still love my man. I can recognize I need a man and still be a strong woman. African womanism grows out of African culture, but uh, feminism is a white Eurocentric thing. See, when a white woman fought against the white male, it made total sense because the white male controlled her. The white male dominated her. The white man told the white woman, you cannot go to college, you cannot leave the house, you cannot wear pants, you cannot go to school. He controlled her. Your place is in the house with the children. Because he controlled the society, he naturally controlled her. That is not that does not have a parallel in the black community. The black man has never been in control of the black woman. We've never controlled what they wore. We never controlled what they worked. We never controlled what they did out the house. We didn't do it then, and we definitely can't do it now. You see, so using a white woman's political reality and trying to approximate that in the black community towards black men has only served to intensify the division between black men and black women. And it's not all sisters either. You have brothers who take the same negative issue towards black women that black women take towards them. They see the fact that she has more education and more income as a symbol of her desire to oppress and surpass the black man. That's not necessarily the case. The black woman is merely benefiting from a circumstance in history that the white man created in order to marginalize black males, just like the black man is suffering from a circumstance in history that the white man created to try to eliminate him from the social fabric of the country altogether. So black men and black women need to recognize that our main enemy is not each other. It is white supremacy. But the feminist movement is positing that the black man is the black woman's problem, which is quite interesting because we don't control a single institution in this country. So how could we possibly be your main issue? True, true. And yeah. to bring up the topic, like, okay, back during the Baltimore riots and you saw the sister snatch her son up in the mix of the whole riot movement. Like, what are your thoughts on like how that played out? Because me personally, I said she did it just to be seen. 
Some may agree, some may not. But, you know, fill me in on what you felt about that. I think it was a nervous reaction. I thought it was a nervous reaction of a mother concerned that her son could ultimately be arrested or shot. And sometimes when, you know, we react nervously out of fear, anxiety, apprehension of what may come, we can do something like that. So the initial reaction, I thought it was innocent anxiety. I thought it was a nervous mother's response to her concern for her son. However, in the aftermath, I did not appreciate her allowing the white media to use her as a voice against the youth who were rebelling in the streets. I didn't appreciate the fact that she took her son on all of these white talk shows and made him talk about what she did to him and then let white folk uphold it as if it was something glorious for a black female to physically attack a black male in public and then use it as if it was a teaching tool for other black parents. I didn't appreciate her allowing herself to be used by white supremacy to further, further marginalize, castigate, and uh, ostracized the black male. I didn't appreciate what she did after the fact, but in the moment, I thought it was innocent. But she took away that innocence the minute she tried to use it as an opportunity to become famous. Yeah, I kind of agree with that, too. Because, like, at the end of the day, I said it, like, you know, me and my wife spoke on it, and I said, like, watch what happens afterwards. It's the after effect that's what's going to play it out the most. It's always the aftershock. She psychologically castrated that boy. Not because of what she'd done when she smacked him all up. Even he probably knew that was nervous energy. But then when she paraded him around the country on TV and on talk show, that was an act of psychological castration. And black boys go through that too much, not just from their mothers, because I don't think most black mothers psychologically castrate their sons. But in society in general, we have to go through that on the job. We have to go through that in society. We have to go through that with the police. We have to go through that in the school. And when we talk about psychological castration versus physical castration, physical castration is when your penis is cut off. And by the way, 95% of the time when a black man was hung in America, he was castrated, which is interesting because 95% of the time when Italians, Jews, and Irish were hung in America, they were never castigated, castrated. So why was black men almost always castrated, whereas Southern European immigrants were almost never castrated when they were lynched? And the answer to that is the white man's fear of the black man's penis. See, the black man has the ability to change the complexion of the entire earth. He can eliminate white folk just through reproduction. He don't have to create AIDS. He don't have to push homosexuality. He doesn't have to come up with abortion. He doesn't have to come up with Ebola. He doesn't doesn't have to poison the water supply or the food supply. If the black man wants to exterminate the white man, all he got to do is sleep with his woman. He can naturally exterminate it because he's the possessor of the dominant gene. The white male knows that. So if the white male wants to exterminate the black male, he cannot do so naturally. His penis inside of a black woman produces a black child. It doesn't produce a white child. And because he's constantly aware of this, because this is the white man's paranoia, whenever he lynched a black male, he cut off the penis. So that's physical castration. But then we look at social castration, which is what we see every day, the psychological castration, where black men are not allowed to stand up to police. Black men are not allowed to stand up to their boss. They might get fired. You see, black men are not allowed to really say how they feel sometimes to the mothers of their children for fear that she can keep their kids away from them and then have that decision supported by the family courts of America. So when you look at the black man's predicament in America, we have largely been psychological castrated, i.e. never having really been allowed to be men. We're not allowed to flex our muscle because whenever we flex our muscle intellectually, socially, physically, or any other way is viewed as a threat in this society. Black manhood is a threat, which is why we see the assault on the alpha male within the black community. When you look around now, whether you look at church, politics, business, media, when you look at all of these major uh, social institutions, the black male that is put out in front of you is a very effeminate black male. He may not be homosexual, but he is quite effeminate in his dress, quite effeminate in his speech, quite effeminate in his posture. Why do we see this rise of the effeminate black male taking over the black church, the effeminate black male taking over the scholarship positions in America's major uh, universities and historically black institutions we made at? Why do we see the black male uh, taking over in mainstream media spots where they allow black men to exist? In every 
every major avenue of society, the alpha black male has been replaced by the effeminate black male. This is part of the homosexualization of the black community in general, but it also speaks to the fact that the alpha male is public enemy number one. The alpha male is what the white man is scared of. Is scared of. The white man is not comfortable working with a black alpha male. He will only tolerate the effeminate black man. And that's why we see so many successful effeminate black men and the alpha males are sent to jail. Ooh, that's deep. And that's why, like, you see TV nowadays, there's a lot of openly gay shows roaming the networks nowadays. It's sick. It is absolutely sick, and, and, and it's, it's interesting how much faith black people have in white people. And I say that because 10 years ago, 10 years ago, I had predicted that the schools would begin to teach homosexuality. It would be within the curriculum, and you've got about five states that are already doing it now with other states that are coming online. Okay, so they're teaching homosexual history while they're getting rid of the history of enslavement in America. Oh okay, my and then and then on top of that, you know, we see the homosexual TV stations, homosexual radio stations, homosexual magazines. There's even a homosexual Bible now, a Bible just for gays. So wow. we're seeing the normalization of homosexuality while we see the demonization of alpha maleism within black men. If you look at it, there's an attack on the black family while there is a simultaneous support for the homosexual union. I mean, look at all the movies and TV shows that attack the image of the black family. Look at Scandal. Look at Empire. Look at the movie Addicted. Uh, look at the other movie uh, with Taraji P. Henson and Idris Elba. Uh, I forget the name of it. When he broke oh, out of no good deed. No, no, no. Good no. Is that it? No look good at deed. all these images of the black family. Look at most of the movies now about black love. Okay, totally projecting a negative image of black love to our children. But at the same time that you're seeing negative images portrayed about the black family, you're seeing nothing but positive images portrayed about LBGT love, positive images about homosexual love, positive images about biracial, excuse me, uh, bisexual love, biracial love as well, bisexual and biracial love for that matter. Why are they doing this? They're conditioning our children. They're conditioning our children. If you want to control the society, you must control the minds of the children. They're making black girls think that black men are a waste of your time. They're making black boys think the same. They're making black girls think that you might be happier with a female than with a male. They're teaching black men the same thing. You may be better off with a man than you would ever be with a woman. These shows, these songs that we're seeing, all of this is being done to sell black youth a belief that the LBG family structure is something that's going to be much more conducive to what you're looking for. Mm. Wow. Well, and that's why I'm not on Oprah. You see, because mm. the truth is never to be told publicly. The truth mm. is always to be marginalized. You see, they'll give the microphone to Cornell. They'll give the microphone to Tavis. They'll give the microphone to Al or to Jesse, because anything that comes out of their mouth, even if it challenges the social status quo, won't go against it. My message goes directly against it. And because it is a truthful message, it will make people wake up and wonder. Yesterday, going through the airport in Minneapolis and Philadelphia, I got stopped by so many people who recently saw the Breakfast Club interview I did back in uh, the end of last month. And they're like, wow, I never saw it that way. I never thought about it this way. I never heard anyone talk about homosexuality as possibly being an outgrowth of a black male having not having the black father and that love for that maternal parental figure not being there could trigger a thirst that another man can use and manipulate into a homosexual relationship they said i never heard it put that way and you're never going to hear it put that way because america will never ever give you any serious intellectual dialogue that goes against the social agenda you'll never get a serious dialogue that goes against the social agenda never will you do that you see because in order to control people, you've got to control the ideas that goes into the people's head. So the last thing you need is Umar Johnson upsetting the apple cart by bringing things to the collective black psyche in America that have hence to fore never been considered. Ideas rule the world. Ideas rule the world. And if you want to keep control over the world, you must control the ideas that enter into mainstream media. True. Ahead, Ms. Moss. That makes sense. <laughs> 
Oh, I was just going to say, actually, I wanted to kind of get more into, I wanted to talk more about Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. For our listeners who are not aware, I want you to kind of tell them about it, what it means to you, and what will the curriculum be? Well, the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy as an entrepreneurial institution will be revolutionary in the standpoint that we're going to redirect the academic trajectory for black children. Right now in America, 99.9% of every school has one goal. I don't care if it's African-centered, public, parochial, charter, or independent. And that goal is to send our kids to college. That is the purpose Mm -hmm. of public education, to make sure you get accepted to college. Well, to me, that's not good enough. Why? Everybody will get accepted to college. Every kid is going to get accepted to college because college is business. College yep. is educational exploitation. If you That's want to right. go to college and you got a GED or, or diploma, you will get in because colleges are businesses. So to say that 100% of our kids got accepted to college, with all due respect, that does not impress me at all. Okay? That's like saying 100% of our kids went to McDonald's. Okay? That doesn't mean anything. College is a business. Also, college is not guaranteeing opportunity for African children. After sure they is not. We have over 2 million college-educated Africans in this country who cannot find a job. They are homeless and in a soup kitchen. I just got an email the other day from a lawyer, a lawyer, black lawyer, graduated summa cum laude from, from graduate school and cannot find a job. A black lawyer. Are you serious? You see, yep. so so just getting our kids a college degree isn't doing anything but putting them into debt to the bankers. Debt. I want to reorient yes. that. I want our children to recognize that you can become rich and wealthy without a college degree. In fact, that one that the top one percent richest people in the world and the top one percent richest people in this country not only did not did go not. to college. Okay, most of them don't even go to work to own their money. Uh-huh. The richest people <laughs> in the world live off of what we call unearned income. It is income that is produced without a need for labor i.e. investments. So we want to teach our people, our, our children, how to build businesses, corporations, multinational industries. We want to teach them how to get wealthy through agriculture, not just learning how to grow food, but how you turn food into a business. Most people don't know this, but agribusiness is the number one corporation in the world. Selling food is the number one business. And why? There's six billion people in the world. All of them Love have to eat. eat in order to live. You understand? So it's natural that agribusiness is the top business. How many black people we know who are actually benefiting from agribusiness? I don't know one. I know some farmers, but they're small time, low scale. I don't know of any major black-owned agribusiness on the planet Earth. We have to change that. We're also going to teach them dietary and nutritional science so they'll be able to heal the human body without white pharmaceuticals because pharmaceuticals are killing black folks. For mental pharmaceuticals, physical pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals are killing black folks, and we have to change that. We're also going to teach them political and military science, political science, which is understanding white supremacy as well as the world in which they live. Why are black women least likely to get married? Why are why do black women lead the developed world with the highest infant mortality rate? Why are black men being mass incarcerated, underemployed, undereducated. Why can't black men and black women get along, okay, more often than not? Why? Who created AIDS, and why did they create AIDS? Why was Obama made president, and why did he do absolutely nothing for black people, although he went out of his way to fight for homosexuals, Latinos, and white women? Political science, understanding how the world works, that's critical, because we do a good job in some schools of teaching our kids their ancient history teaching them the history of Africa. That's beautiful. History, play, enslavement. You need to know from whence you came. I support it. But teaching them what happened 10,000 years ago and not teaching them about what happened 10 days ago isn't helping our children. You're giving them a lopsided education. They need to know why Trayvon was murdered and the police got away with it, why Eric Garner was murdered and the police got away with it, why the young brother down in Charlotte was murdered. He didn't even have shoes on his feet. He went knocking on the door for help and got shot. Okay, they need to understand why police are not being held accountable for the murders of black men, and that is because the police are an extension of the military, and America has the clear war on black people. So whenever a soldier carries out his job responsibility, it's never a crime. In fact, he's more likely to be rewarded than he is punished. 
you see. So we want to make sure they understand that. Military science, they're going to be trained with weapons, and they're also going to be trained with non-weapons combat. They have to be able to defend life. The girls will be taught this as well as the boys. The financial curriculum, they will be taught real estate. They will know how to do their own taxes. They will be taught stocks, bonds, mutual funds, multinational uh, investments. They will have their own business plan. Okay, when they graduate, they will be able to earn a living in at least a dozen different areas. We also plan to have all the trades, carpentry, auto body, plumbing, electrician. Trades, by the way, I should mention, were all stripped out of the black community in the late 70s, going into the early 80s, just before the CIA dropped off crack cocaine, okay, so they, they can set up the mass incarceration war against black males by stripping the inner city high schools of trade earning programs. You see, so all this is by design, and this is why our kids need to be educated because a lot of our kids are being taught that black people are in the condition they're in solely because of their own doing. I would admit that black people stay in the condition we're in because of our own doing, but black people were not put, black people did not put themselves in this condition. We don't control the jails. We don't control the criminal justice system. We do not control the schools. We do not control the economic order. So it is absolutely impossible for black men to be responsible for their own mass incarceration and their own miseducation where they do not control the apparatus that produces that result. We're also going to, do, going to teach them African spirituality and cosmology. We want them to see the world through an African frame of reference, not just a Eurocentric or a Hebrew Christian Islamic uh, perspective, because the Hebrew Christian Islamic uh, interpretation of reality has been the ruling regime for the last 1,000 years. And I'm not taking issue with nobody's religion, but there's another way of seeing this world, and it's not through the um, is, and it's not through the patriarchal um, religious standpoint. So our school is going to be revolutionary because it's going to teach our kids how to think, how to think in the best interests of African people, and then after you receive that education, how to build for the best right. interests of African people. You know something? Right. Uh, the, the comment you made about the whole crack cocaine thing. Now, being a, a child of New York, you know, during that time I was, you know, I was still a kid. But once I was able to understand why that happened, I saw all the outlets and everything that played a part in that. Because the white people actually moved outside the urban areas of New York City when crack hit, like right before crack hit. And then you saw the destruction of the families, people going to jail, people killing each other over that and everything. And the next thing you know, now you look at New York City, white people have moved back. They took over. They put all types of juice bars and all types of stuff in there that wasn't there in Brooklyn or Manhattan or Queens or any place like that. So when you look at New York now, you can tell that was set up. Without question. All by design, social engineering. See, here's the thing that people fail to realize. People say, well, you know, ain't nobody make them use crack. The CIA may have brought the crack in, but nobody made them use it. You know, the government might bring in the alcohol, but don't nobody make them get drunk. That's not true. That's not true. Human beings are basically motivated by a fundamental desire to achieve pleasure and to avoid pain. Mm -hmm. Human beings are also creatures of their environment. The average human being is a creature of their environment. If you put something in their environment, nine times out of ten, they are going to experiment with it because that is part of the curiosity that is uh, germane to the human condition. So if you take poor people, miseducated, castrated, who've been engineered to self-hate, you don't give them no opportunity by which to improve their situation. But then you bring drugs in, you bring prostitution in, you bring guns in. You bring alcohol in, you bring cigarette, you bring heroin in. It's just a matter of time before they experiment with it. Not black people. White people did the same thing. Jews did the same thing. Irish did the same thing. Before America gave them jobs, before they told the Irish that they can run the police, and before they told the Italians they can run the fire department, before they gave the Jews all the civil service jobs downtown, they were getting drunk, they were gangbanging, they were selling crack, dealing guns, running gangs. They did the exact same thing our people are doing because that is part of the human condition that you look for any root of escapism to help drown out your misery. That is what people do. That's what people do. So to say that, oh, you put it there, but they didn't have to do it, that's ridiculous. Humans are creatures of their environment. And you can engineer any population to fail by strategically putting certain variables within their reach that you know they will grab onto to try to rescue themselves from some degree of despair, but that you control and know ultimately will lead them to an early death. So there's no such thing as people generally being able to escape 
the social machinations that are put within them. This whole world is, is, is engineered for people to do certain things. The way you shop is engineered. The way you buy is engineered. Your core beliefs are engineered. Everybody knows this. We studied in psychology. But whenever it comes to black people, we're not allowed to say that it was the poverty. We're not allowed to say that it was the war on black men. We're not allowed to say that it was the government's alcohol or the CIA's crack. We're supposed to blame black people for the things that were done to black people. Right. Now, I want to actually go back to the academy a, a little more. Um, I actually love the I, I love the whole the idea. I love what you're trying to do. But I know that the only thing that's standing in between making it happen is the money factor. So have you raised more money since within a month uh, than you had what last? What do you mean when you say have I raised more within a month? Well, I know, like in your last interview with the Breakfast Club, you had mentioned how, where you were at with it. And I just wanted to know, like, have you raised oh, yes, more since yes. then? Now, some of that was stimulated by the Breakfast Club, but some of that was going to happen anyway, only because we've been getting tremendous support for the fundraiser since it started last May of 2014. Okay. The support has been there. The problem with the fundraiser is, is how do I want to say this? We get hundreds of donations a week. And okay. most of our donors donate over and over again. So I don't get one-time donors. I get people who come back consistently. Good. So, so the energy is there. The quality of the donation is there. It's the quantity. In other words, the people who are donating are doing all they can. It's the people right. who have not yet donated who need to start donating. So in other words, right. there's a lot of energy behind this. If my goal was 500000 we would have reached it already. But because the goal is $2 million, which is, you know, higher than what we would like it to be, it appears that the energy that needs to be behind the fundraiser is not there, which is incorrect. The energy is there. I mean, every time I go to the post office, the P.O. box is filled up with envelopes. They're normally That's holding good. them for me in the back, but it's the amount, you know, because our people – are struggling, so they might only be able right. to give me a $20 check, a $50 check, a $10 check. So I might have 500 pieces of mail, but the highest donation in that mail might be $100, and it might only be one or two of those. So I have a large right. volume of donations. It's just that the amount of the donations are somewhat humble, and that's no criticism to the folks who donate right. because it's those 5 and $10 checks that got us to 500,000, but it's the people who have not yet donated. Those are the people who I want to sound out, the people who haven't written the check yet, but will say they don't like the school system, the people who will say they're trying to put my son in special ed, but I haven't made a single contribution to Dr. Umar's fundraiser. It's the do-nots. The people who are doing, I can't ask them to do no more. You know, I got grandmoms who send me $5 every month when they get their retirement pension. I can't ask her to do no more than that because she's on a fixed income as it is. It's the do not people who I'm trying to reach, all those Africans who have yet to make a donation. Those are the ones we really want to start giving. But, yes, you're correct. Since the interview, I've seen a lot more names. You know, there's been a lot more uh, diversity in the names and in the locations from which the donations are coming. So I, I definitely think the Breakfast View, the Breakfast Club interview helped every interview and every appearance, you know, that I does help. We've steadily been moving up, but we were at 500000 before the Breakfast Club. So it'll be interesting to see where we are I would say by the end of this month, because the Breakfast Club interview was uploaded on the 31st of August. So the 31st of September, I'll be in a better position to tell you exactly how much okay. energy that interview actually brought to the fundraiser. Wow. Okay, yeah, this, no. I was just going to say, because I really, I really would love to see you get this off the ground, because everything that you mentioned that's going to be in the curriculum, we need it. It needs to be implemented in our society, within our culture. And so. not to be arrogant. Education is a human service field, which is to say that it doesn't matter how good your curriculum is. It doesn't matter how good your pedagogy is. It doesn't matter how good your school concept is. It doesn't matter how well your teacher's been educated, where they got their doctorates from. What ultimately matters is the people who you put in front of those children. And this is no knock to anyone out anyone else out there with an independent African school, but I know that the energy I'm going to bring to the table as the principal of this school is going to provide our children with a quality of education that they're not getting at any other school in existence because it's the person. It's the right. person that makes the difference. Like at my last school, you know, and I had to quit when I was principal at my last school last year because I wasn't allowed to run the school the way that it needed to be ran for the benefit of our children. So unfortunately, I had to quit because I refused to be used as somebody's uh, – 
test kit or research monkey or stooge. So I quit the job. But from the parents and the staff after I left, everybody said the same thing. They said, it was you more than what you did. The systems you put in place were wonderful. We needed that. The way in which you made the teachers do their lesson plans, we needed that structure. But it was Dr. Umar Johnson that made the difference in the school. And when you deal with helping professions, that's what it comes down to. A social worker, a therapist, a counselor, a a, a, a principal, a school teacher, these are helping professions. Your degrees, they are relevant to some extent. Your training it is relevant to some extent, but it is actually the relationship between you and the people you're trying to help that make the biggest difference. Take psychotherapy. In psychotherapy, 15% of the variance of treatment can be attributed to the treatment modality. In other words, 85% of the reason people do better in therapy is because of the person who's helping them. So we go to school and learn all these fancy strategies, but at the end of the day, none of that accounts for why people change. People change because the person they're working with was able to spark something in them that brought them to change. It's the same way with education. So the secret weapon for Dr. Umar Johnson's school, although the curriculum is totally revolutionary, nobody else is doing what I'm going to be doing, but it is me. I'm the secret weapon that's going to make this school such the historic place that it's going to be. Okay. And how long would students attend the academy before they actually graduate? Would it be the traditional four years or yeah, less? Yeah, it'll be, it'll be 12 years. It'll be 12 years. But the way okay. we're going to engineer the school is that in the high school years, a lot of our children will be getting the same quality of trade school education that you would get as if you were at a small business college or, or trade school academy. So in the high school years, I don't believe that a child should just sit in front of the desk for seven hours. Nonsense. They should be learning practical trades in high school. In fact, we're even going to start that in middle school. I just don't want them graduating with knowledge. That's what America's public school does. You graduate with a bunch of facts and statistics that are totally irrelevant. I want our kids to graduate with skills. Rarely do black high school children graduate from with skills. Even in African city schools, they don't graduate with skills. They graduate with knowledge and skill sets, but not with practical skills. I want our children to graduate with skills. I want them to be able to go into work the day after graduation working for themselves. Right, and that's important because I was actually reading where economists are suggesting nowadays to kind of go more into the trade field as opposed to a four-year college because of oh, the very reasons question. that you just stated. Exactly. And as a result of black people divesting from the trade school programs, look who now is dominating the building trades, Latinos and Chinese. Of course, the white man, he's the top uh, exploiter okay, or controller of the building trades programs because he runs the unions. But after the white man, Latinos and Chinese, Mexicans and Chinese. When you look around the different cities, look who's building the new buildings now. Look who's doing all the work. If they're not white, they're Mexican and Chinese, when it should be black men and black women. Part of that is our fault. Not only was it racism, not only was the de was it the deindustrialization of the inner city high school, but it was also due to the fact that black people had gotten so tired of only being allowed to engage in manual labor. See, at one time, you could only be a plumber. At one time, you could only be an electrician. And so we had gotten so tired of being typecasted into blue-collar professions that we stopped exposing our children to blue-collar professions. We considered them to be beneath us. And when we did that, we played white right into the hands of white supremacy. And so beginning in the late 60s, once the Civil Rights Bill passed and most of the colleges were integrated, black people started sending all their kids to college and we stopped sending them to the trade school. And when we did that, we set up a situation from which we're still suffering from today, and that is the total domination of the building trades, not only by white, but by Mexican and Chinese as well. That was a big mistake that we made that we should have never done. We should have continued in the building trades. We should have done both. The white man does both. Chinese does both. Black people, we lopsided. Everybody has a professional degree, but not many of us have those building trades. And right. we need to increase the amount of black men and women. And women. Our daughters are rarely exposed to building trade career opportunities. Rarely. How often do you see a black female electrician, black female plumber, black female carpenter? And there's opportunities in this, especially for black women. Why? Because the alpha male has been marginalized. So if they're not going to give the black man the training in the profession, that opens up a pathway for the black woman. So we really need to stop typecasting our children and gender casting them into certain professions. A man can be a nurse and a teacher. 
okay? And a woman can be an electrician and an auto body mechanic. Right. Now, I understand that the parents will be paying tuition for your academy, correct? Oh, of course. It can't run for free. So parents will have to pay tuition, which will not be an issue because black parents all across America are paying tuition for their children to go to white schools. And I know because I do the IQ test. You'd be surprised the amount of money that black parents are paying just to give their child a better education. So, yes, they will have to pay in the final analysis, I would like, and of course this is long term, maybe 20, 30 years down the road when I'm about ready to retire, I would like a situation where we have raised enough money and have floated enough bonds where the school can operate on its own interests, you know, like a lot of colleges do. They're able to operate colleges off of the interests, off of the foundations that were established in their name. I would like to get to a point like that. But in the short term, yes, unless some of these rich black folks start stepping up to the plate and start volunteering like rich white folks do all the time at white schools, you know, to contribute a certain amount of money every year for the education of our children, the parents will have to pay. But they have the ability to do it. They buy everything else, buy your child's education. Right. Right. Now, at this point, do you have... Are you able to give us a ballpark figure of what tuition will cost? Nah, it's impossible okay. because I don't know what the final cost is going to be on the building, and I don't know where the final location is going to be. So I want okay. St. Paul's. You know, that's where I want to be. You know, but if right. we don't raise the, the, the $2 million, I'm going to have to set up for something else. And, of course, if I don't get St. Paul's, which means we don't have a residential school, which is what I want, residential, that's my concept. But if I have to settle for a regular traditional school building, then – you know, the tuition will be much cheaper because the kids will not be staying there. You know, so on one hand, it's cheaper, but on the other hand, it's really not what our children need. They need the full gamut. They need the 24-hour-a-day away from the ghetto in the middle of nowhere, detox your mind education. That's what they need. But until I settle on a location, it will be difficult to come up with the cost of the tuition. But it will not be a for-profit school. It will not be a for-profit school. Uh, It will be a school that seeks to educate our children at the cheapest dollar possible. So I'm not looking to make money off of this. Um, I'm not into this for money. I'm into this to make sure our children learn. So parents will not have to worry about being charged twice what it's actually costing because Dr. Umar wants to put money in his pocket. Uh -uh. I just want to set up a situation where I'm able to cover the monthly expenses, which includes teacher salaries, and educate our children. This is not a for-profit initiative. Okay. Okay. So, um... Ever since the Breakfast Club interview, like, well, when the Breakfast Club interview aired, I jumped on Twitter probably not even five seconds after I watched the whole interview. And there was a comment you made about the black entertainers and stuff donating to the school. And I put out a tweet right afterwards. Why do you think that they don't want to um, participate into the movement of putting the school together? Selfishness and fear. Selfishness and fear. The selfish part basically says... That if I'm going to support someone who's considered as controversial as Dr. Umar, and I hate when people consider me controversial because all I do is speak the truth. When the truth becomes controversial, we have a real big problem. But their thing is, if I support someone like him, the only way I can support him is under the table. Okay, so if Jay-Z, Oprah, LeBron wanted to help me, they could. They could buy that school for me tonight if they wanted to, and they know it. But the selfishness says that I'm going to have to support him under the table because to support him above the table would risk my image in the minds of white folk. So I would have to give Dr. Umar a confidential donation. But I want to be worshipped for the fact that I helped Dr. Umar. I want to be applauded for the fact that I gave Dr. Umar money towards the school. And so the arrogance of the rich black is that they want to get on TV with a big check. You know how they have those big checks. Yeah. It's a $1 million donation from the Jay-Z and Beyonce Foundation to the Dr. Umar Johnson School. They can't do that with me because they'll be chided and castigated by white folk. So t- they couldn't do no public check. It would have to be a secret check. But their ego demands that they be applauded for what they do. So that's the selfish part. The fear comes in from the fact that they know white folks are not going to be look, you know, honorably upon them supporting someone like me. That's where the fear comes in at. And so you know, all of these black folks we're naming have white accounts. 
Nearly every black celebrity you name has a white accountant controlling and supervising their money. So the government knows how they spend it. The government knows where their money goes because they don't put black folks in charge of it. They put white folks in charge of it. So to write me a million-dollar check, their accountant is going to see that. Umar Johnson got a million dollars. Let me Google who the hell this Umar Johnson is. And then the next thing you know, they're pulling LeBron to the side. Like, hey, buddy, you got to watch this because this guy is not popular amongst white folk. And if they find out that you're supporting his initiative, then guess what? The fact that he doesn't support homosexuality might get extended to you. You see, so that's the fear part, you know, and that's why a lot of these athletes and celebrities can't help us because their entire economic structure is being overseen by white people. Now, on the flip side, white people don't have to worry about that because their financial structure is being overseen by whites. So if the white person want to sneak off a million dollars to an unpopular white group, they can do it because it's all white folks in that whole process. But with black folk, it's the opposite. They hold money. They hold money processes is overseen by white people. So you have fear on the one side of being alienated, castigated, destroyed, okay, set up, and then on the other hand, you have the selfishness, the arrogance that says I'm not giving them nothing unless I can be worshipped for doing so on TV. Yeah, that's what they need to cut that out, like, for real. <laughs> they know they should have been gave me that money. They know ain't nobody as serious as me, but that's the fear of it as well. That's the fear of it as well. The sad thing is they'll probably want to do it when they're old. But the thing is, most of those guys are my age. You know, so when you get old, <laughs> I get old. I need to be able to make this difference in the lives of our children now. I can't be waiting till I'm 70 or 80. What we, we, we need to do it now. You know, now is the time to act. I mean, as I said earlier, you know, this is the uh, sequicentennial for our emancipation. This is the 150th year, December 6th of 1865, the 13th Amendment was uh, was ratified. December 6th of 2015 will be exactly 150 years out of slavery, our secular centennial. And what do we have to show for it? 150 years later, what do we have to show for it? I'm up here where Frederick Douglass is buried. Harriet Tubman is buried up here in Rochester, New York. I mean, what are they saying? What are they saying from the grave? You know, what is their, you know, are they content with how much progress we've made? If they were walking amongst us now, what would Harriet Tubman say? I free slaves for this? This is what I did this for? So you can be a rapper and, 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 and twerker and dye your hair blonde? This is what I did this for empire and scandal? This is what I did this for? So we got to do some soul searching because I know our ancestors are not pleased with us. They are not. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. So, like, um, why do you think black America have more insecurities in this day and age? Because black folks have lost their own way. They've lost their own sense of identity. They've totally drunk in the Kool-Aid that says that they were American. I think the Obama, seven years of Obamaism going on eight years, really hurt us. Because Obama, more than any other president, made black people believe that America wanted them. No other president was able to convince us to drop our guard like Obama did, and we fell for that. And when we dropped our guard, you know what we did? We gave right racism seven years to replan, reprogram, refuel, and re-strengthen his arsenal. And look, it's coming back with a vengeance. Trayvon, Eric, all these murders are nothing but the revenge of white racism. This was a setup to set us back. It was a setup for a comeback. We're going to put Obama in there, make these Negroes think America is actually becoming a post-racial when all America is doing is becoming more racial. Mm. Mm. And with that, how do you feel about the current presidential election for 2016? It, it, it doesn't matter who goes in. See, we got to recognize something. America is a dictatorship. But because the dictator wears two heads, a Democratic head and a Republican head, we think we have choice. The illusion of inclusion and the illusion of option is what's killing all of Americans, but especially black folk. See, you're not free because you have a right to choose. And I need your listeners to understand this. You are not free because you have a right to choose. You are free when you have a right to determine the options that will be put up for choosing. So you live in a neighborhood that's ran by a gang. You're being extorted by a gang. And they say, well, listen, you can be extorted by this gang or you can be extorted by that gang. But what if you don't want to be extorted by a gang at all? That's true freedom. You don't have the choice to opt out. You can't opt out. You're either going to choose this one or that one. But either one you choose, you're still going to be under the control of the privileged white elite. So the illusion of choice is suffocating the hell out of black folks. You don't have no choice. White folks don't even have no choice. 
the Constitution clearly tells us that the president is chosen by the electoral college, rich, white, property-owning men with power. And the only reason why you have an electoral college is to make sure the common man doesn't choose the president. America is a dictatorship, but to their credit, they have very intelligently and, 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 and Machiavellianistically made people believe that you actually control this country. You have no say so whatsoever in this country because you do not control the options. The only thing you get is to choose between those options. True power is controlling the options. True power is coming up with the alternatives. There's no power in simply selecting between the two when they've been pre-selected for you already. True, true. And that's why I told these people, out like, y'all better get y'all madness together because when Obama is gone, y'all about to see a whole new ball game. Oh, man. Black <laughs> people are going to get ignored like no tomorrow. And I just did an article that I just submitted uh, this morning, which is probably going to uh, set off a lot of uh, aftershock. But the article is called All Lives Matter. And the subtitle is Multiculturalism as white racism's newest weapon against the black agenda. And basically speaks to how the United States government is using the homosexual movement, the women's movement, and the Latino movement to basically erase black people off the face of this country. That's what This is what post-racial is about. This is what multiculturalism is about. It's about finding more sophisticated ways to ignore black people. We can no longer just ignore black people and focus on white folks because that looks like obvious racism. But what if we ignore black people and focus on Latinos? What if we ignore black people and focus on gays? What if we ignore black people and focus on women? What if we ignore black people and focus on uh, the bears and the sharks and the dolphins and all the ex endangered uh, species animals? That's the new strategy of racism. We're not going to ignore you. We're going to say you're not the only minorities here. You guys are selfish and arrogant to think that the United States government is supposed to spend all their time on you. We have other groups. We got gay people. We got animals that are sick. We got Latinos. We got white women. You're not the only minority here. And that's the game that they're playing on Negroes, and Negroes are falling for. Look at all the black women who are running behind the feminist movement. Look at them. So when they come out of college, they get their feminist paper. They go running after feminism. I'm a woman. Da, 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 da. But you're I black woman, hear me roar. <laughs> You're supposed to be fighting for the black issue. You don't fight against the black man with no white woman. Are you out of your mind? Look at all the black folks running behind the LBGT. I'm gay and I'm proud. Proud and I'm gay. Gay people are being oppressed. Was Trayvon Martin gay? Was Eric Garner gay? Was Michael Brown gay? Was Freddie Gray gay? No, they were not. They were heterosexual alpha males and thus they were exterminated. Was Sandra Bland gay? No. She's a heterosexual black female. But see, they don't care about that. They only care about folks who identify with their in-group. So you got the LBGT drafting blacks to pay more attention to them than us. You got the white women drafting these black feminists to pay more attention to women's issues than black issues. You see? And they even got black folks running after the Latinos. Okay, I want to help the immigrants out. Immigrants don't give a damn about you. Ain't no Latino organization in this country ever come to the aid of black people, ever. But we want to keep talking about the Latinos, our brothers, our Latino brothers and sisters. When the last time you heard the Latinos talk about our African brothers and sisters? Never, and they never will. Don't none of them three groups give a damn about black people, gays, women, and Latinos. They don't care about you. They only care about themselves. But black folks feel like we got to love everybody. We to love everybody, people. And that's why we don't get no respect. We don't get no respect because people don't understand. Don't nobody like y'all. Don't nobody like y'all, but y'all want to keep on fighting for us, and we don't even need your help. Why are you fighting for people who don't even need your help? Because you got low self-esteem and you want to be accepted. You're afraid to stand alone. And that's why my rallying cry is unapologetically African. I'm saying we got to be unapologetically African. I'm speaking for black people, black people only. I might shout out the African Latinos because, you know, there are a sizable proportion of Latino people who are of African descent and who are not afraid of it. Now, most of them are. Most of most Latinos ain't going to tell you that they got a great grandmom who blew black purple. Okay, they've decided to cut off their connection to Africa as a way to improve themselves in America because they learn by watching us that being black and proud don't get you nowhere in the States. So they have 
totally committed uh, 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 genealogical suicide, biological suicide. The Latino is not interested in their African roots at all. They have dismissed them and stepped away. But we want to keep on pulling them back. Come on back. Don't you know you're black? They know they're black. They don't give a damn about that because being black ain't going to get you nowhere in this country. So we got to recognize that these three minority groups are being used to take all the attention away from the black agenda and put it on them, and they are doing it. And they are doing it voluntarily because they don't like us either. They hate us just as much as white folks do. Latinos can't stand black people. Gay people can't stand black people. And white women can't stand black people. And the sooner we understand that, the better we be off. We don't have no allies. All we have is each other. And the minute we realize that all we need is each other, we'd be able to fix this thing. But trying to hold hands and join hands, that's the mistake that was made in civil rights. That's the mistake of the Urban League, the mistake of the NAACP, the mistake of the black church. When are we going to learn? That trying to form coalitions with people who do not like you will not benefit you. But that Jesus, every Sunday in church, God don't have no color. God don't see no color. So you get that stuff brainwashed into you long enough, you start believing that you got to be for everybody. And in being for everybody else, you can't possibly be be for yourself. And that's another thing. People need to let go of that whole religion madness because that's what's keeping you trapped right now. You know, because I tell this to um, I spoke this earlier about how back in the days during the slavery era that the white man used to hold the Bible when they used to beat the slaves and try to embed it in their head that the, that God is white and you must obey the white man because our God is white and it all relates together or something like that. But then people are so stuck, like they're really stuck in believing that all of this is true. And I tell them, like, yo, when you die. You're not coming back into an afterlife. There's no afterlife for you because if that was the case, your parents or your great parents, whoever passed away, you would actually have seen some type of sign that they are still alive, that they're reincarnated through something else. People need to let that go because once you let it go, then you'll you'll let go of that web that the white man has, the, the white culture has over black America. You know what I mean? Oh, without question, without question. But again, you know, we're the only people who've never really been for ourselves because we've never been allowed to be for ourselves. You know, and that's where a lot of this comes from. You know, it's it's black people feel bad just caring about themselves. You know, we, we, we don't like it. It, it. It's so foreign to us. We've always been for everybody, you know, because that's what slavery did. You know, slavery put you, you know, for everybody. And it's time for us to change that paradigm. I mean, that's a 150-year-old paradigm that we better change or we're going to be exterminated. You cannot keep loving your enemy and thinking you're going to overcome this thing. It has to stop. And then everybody reading the book of the art of war and still doing the ignorance that they're doing. I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> I really don't understand it. So, like, and I has another argument that, you know, not to jump back on the, the gay agenda thing, but, like, I have these arguments on social media a lot with a lot of people that are for this whole gay thing. And I'm like, yo, a lot of people, uh, I try to tell them, like, you're not born gay. Could you please clear that up for me so for them so they can have a better understanding? Because I know they're listening. I know they're listening right now. Well, here's the thing. That's always going to be a debate because, in theory, you can't prove it one way or the other. See, whenever you have a theory, you have the fact that people, you know, can argue on both sides of the aisle because theories can never in actuality be proven, you see. So the theory that people are born gay has yet to be proven, you know, and isn't going to be proven because you cannot prove that, you see. First of all, behavior, we've never had a situation where people believe that behaviors were inherited anyway until homosexuality. You never had that, okay? But there is a school of thought that have always taught that, and that is the eugenics movement white racist science they taught that every defect of black people was due to their dna when slavery was over and black people had to steal to eat because they couldn't find jobs they said it was in their dna their dna you know prepared them to be thieves you know if a woman had babies before she got married that was in her dna so we got to recognize something the only science that ever taught that behaviors behaviors not physical traits we ain't talking about diabetes or cancer we're talking about human behavior the only school of thought that ever posited that human behavior could be genetically inherited was the eugenics camp. So when you say black people are being born gay, you're feeding right into racial science against black folks. Because as I said on the, on the Breakfast Club, if you're going to say people are born gay, they were born predisposed to commit a behavior. 
then you're also fueling the argument that says black people were born pre-exposed to sell drugs. Black, black boys were born pre-exposed to drop out of high school. Black women were born pre-exposed to have babies out of wedlock. You cannot allow for one behavior to be genetically inherited and then say the others were not. Behavior is behavior. Having sex with another man ain't no different than me taking a gun and going out and blowing somebody's bread out, they blank brains out. Both of them are conscious behaviors that I choose to indulge in. Behavior is behavior. And there is no concrete proof anywhere that people are born inheriting their behaviors. First of all, it doesn't make sense anyway because black people do not have a history of homosexuality. So if they're saying that you're homosexual because you was born that way, what ancestor did you get that from? I want to know what black ancestor passed down the gay gene. Now, white folks can probably argue that they have white ancestors that passed down the gay gene because homosexuality has been a part of European culture since the Greco-Roman era. Thanks. So as long as they have had a literate tradition, they have had a homosexual tradition. So it would make sense for white folks to say that. But how can black folks say I inherited homosexuality from my DNA? What ancestor passed that down? I want to know. Because we do not have a history of that. There is no record of homosexuality nowhere in Africa before the coming of the white man. You cannot find it nowhere. And there's, and there's your point right there, people. Now, I don't want to hear nothing about it on Facebook, Twitter, none of that stuff no more. I really don't. Because it's 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 true. <laughs> It's true. And like if you take a time, take time, like most people are in the urban cities and everything, they don't take time to think because they're too busy moving and shaking, trying to keep bills paid and this, that and the third. But when you really sit back and think about it, it all starts to make sense. You know, what I mean, even if you have to move outside of your New York areas or your Chicago areas or your L.A. areas, go into these rural towns, sit back and think. And then you go back, you'll see the truth. You see the truth. None of this stuff is is like like with the whole gay, born gay thing. None of that is truth. You know what I'm saying? There is no real truth behind that. I have gay cousins. I've watched them grow up. You know what I'm saying? They wasn't gay in the beginning, but all of a sudden now they're gay. You know what I'm saying? So that just to show you right there that that whole theory of born being born gay is some BS. I think a lot of a lot of times they say that is because they revert back to when they were little and they say, well, ever since they can remember, oh, they've always liked the same sex or they've always liked to play in their, you know, mom's. Well, we know uh, that's a lie, though, because children are not sexually attracted to anything or anybody. A five-year-old does not have a sexual desire to uh, to cohabitate with somebody. Exactly. So that, 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 that's total nonsense. And I've had great gay people say the same thing to me. Well, since I was five, bull crap, right. no five-year-old is, is attracted to anything, male or female. That's nonsense. It's propaganda, but America's ran on propaganda. And as far as this whole argument of uh, people being born gay, you're not going to see that go anywhere anytime soon because it's helping to fuel the gay movement. See, the reason they want you to believe it's all genetically based is because if I can make you believe that this is due to genetics, you will stop fighting against it. Think about it. If you accept the belief that people are born gay, why would you oppose homosexuality You know, if uh, this is the way people are born? You see, and America loves that because once they can get black people to believe that you're born gay, they're going to get you to believe that you're born murderers too. And then they're going to say, well, it ain't no need to try to rehabilitate black children. We don't need jobs and schools and programs. We just need to lock their asses up for the rest of their life because, after all, they were born with defective DNA that led them to be ADHD, led them to be special, that led them to be killers and robbers and rapists. we got to be very careful about buying the homosexual uh DNA based argument because it's going to open up. It's going to, I'm telling you, it's going to open up a can of worms where they're going to start looking at all kinds of stuff saying this is in your DNA too. You cannot excuse one behavior as being genetically imposed unless you're going to excuse all the behaviors. Right. Facts. Anything else you got to say? <laughs> because I'm content with all the information I just got. <laughs> Believe that. I think that's, I think I've got everything covered too <laughs> on my end. <laughs> So, also want your listeners to know that if they're interested in working at the uh, Fred Douglas Marcus Garvey Academy, they can send their resumes uh, to fdmgresumes at gmail.com, fdmgresumes at gmail.com. Uh, the donations, gofundme.com forward slash Dr. Umar. They can also mail in 
their donations. In fact, most donations come by mail. So what you see on the GoFundMe account, uh, we're coming near two hundred thousand dollars. That's like only a quarter, or maybe a third of what we raise. Most donations come by mail because people don't trust online giving. So if they want to mail their donation, they can make it payable to FDMG Academy, P.O. Box six eight seven two, Philadelphia, PA one nine one three two. That address is also on my website, drumarjohnson.com. Also, want your listeners to know that they can always uh, call in if they have questions about. Their children. I host a free Black Parent Teleconference every Tuesday morning from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. Any question they have about their child, education, or mental health, they could get a free answer uh, from Dr. Umar Johnson. I want them to know that as well. They can also pay for private consultation if they want that on my website. I also do life coaching consultations as well. So if there's an adult with a personal issue, whether it's you know their life goals, uh, certain types of challenges that they're trying to overcome, relationships, anything, I offer life consultations as well that they can sign up for um, on my website. Um, so we have Rochester this weekend. Tomorrow I'm doing a lecture. Uh, Saturday I'm doing a play. I want to invite all your listeners to come out. Uh, the first time Dr. Umar Johnson will be playing Frederick Douglass, the first time ever, um, in a stage play 6-9 to nine at the Frederick Douglass Resource Center here in Rochester, uh, 36 King Street, 6-9 to nine Saturday. There will be a lecture tomorrow, 6-9 to nine Friday. 6-9 to nine Saturday is the play, and then 2-5 to five Sunday we'll be organizing the uh, Rochester chapter of the National Independent Black Parent Association. And if any of your listeners are interested in starting a chapter, of the National Independent Black Parent Association, they can get in contact with me so we can get that popping. Uh, seven committees, Special Ed Committee to fight against special ed fraud and abuse, Discipline Committee to fight against uh, the abuse of our children constantly being suspended and expelled. There will be a policy committee to fight to change the uh, policies that school districts put in place that negatively and disproportionately affect black children. Social Support Committee so we can help all of our Mothers and fathers who are out there struggling with housing, clothing, shelter, and other types of resources. There will be a homeschool committee to help organize the parents and support the parents who are homeschooling their children. There will be a finance committee to investigate how the district is spending their money, our tax dollars. And there will be a parent advocacy committee to train the parents on how to advocate for their children and train other adults in the community to accompany the parents to the school because it's my position that no parent should ever go to a school meeting by themselves. They should always have someone else there who can be a witness to what happened because schools love to lie. They love to misrepresent what parents said, and you always need to have a witness next to you. Uh, Because school is starting, I want your parents to think twice before they get the children evaluated for special education. A lot of time what we think is a learning disability is either a lazy disability on the part of the child or the fact that the child just hasn't been taught. Uh, Too many of our kids are being put in special ed when they've never been taught. He doesn't have a reading disability. He's never been taught how to read. She doesn't have a math disability. She's never been taught how to count. So we have to stop letting white folks put our kids in special ed so they can get money off of them and then legally miseducate them, okay, when we know that the true reason why our kids are behind is because they haven't been taught. We have to stop going along with the okie doke. Learn how to say no. In fact, I'm going to get a t-shirt. It's going to say, just say no to special ed, just say no to ADHD testing, just say no to psychiatric medicine. Those three things, special ed, ADHD, psychiatric medicine, we have to stop because we got to realize something. For every black child in special ed, there was a black parent that put them there. You cannot go to special ed unless your parent sign the paperwork for you to be tested, and then they have to sign the paperwork for you to be put in special ed. So there's two signatures, a signature to test and a signature to place. So I want black parents to stop talking about what the schools are doing to our kids and start talking about what we ourselves are doing to our kids. That was a lot of good information you just gave out, Dr. Umar. We appreciate <laughs> we appreciate that. But I, I have one last question for you from on my end. Um, other than getting your academy up and running what are you looking forward to in 2016 uh to making the national independent black parent association the largest black organization in modern history uh we got 40 million black folk in this country okay that means we have a sizable number of black children every child has two parents not to mention all of the non-parents who can also be a part of the parent association i'm trying to make this the movement of of the decade, the movement of the current age, because we need something 
to galvanize black folk. We need something to wake our people up. Our people are defeated. Black people are psychologically defeated, even conscious folk. You know, I hear them talk about how they think we can't overcome this. You know, our ancestors have been fighting this war for 300 years, and we're still in this condition. Africa still in the condition she in. A lot of black folk are hopeless. They're giving up. I'm not giving up. I'm going to give up when I die. I'm going to fight this fight. I got an obligation to the Most High, to my ancestors, to fight this fight. If Marcus Garvey could fight it, if Harry Tubman could fight it, Sojourner Truth could fight it, Dr. King could fight it, I could fight it. I'm not giving up. Ida B. Wells could fight it. I'm going to fight. I'm not going to quit. They're going to have to kill me before I stop. We have to keep on going because we have to inspire the next generation with hope. If we don't fight, the children are not going to fight. The only way they're going to pick up where we left off is because they saw us fight. I was inspired because Malcolm fought. I was inspired because Garvey and Douglas fought. Our children have to be inspired by knowing that someone in their lifetime stood up and fought. As Marcus Garvey said, what we do now, what we do now, Garvey said, even if we're not successful, what we do now will inspire someone else to work at some future point in time. We don't realize even when we don't succeed, we still influence somebody to try to pick up where we left off. So we can't get caught up in whether we can destroy white supremacy in our lifetime. Will we see an end to uh, black oppression before we die? Probably not. Probably not. You know how many ancestors fought to end slavery who never lived to see December 6, 1865? But they fought anyway because they knew the day would come. We don't fight for us. We fight for generations unborn, and we got to realize that because there's a selfishness to the black struggle. There's a selfishness that says I'm only going to participate in struggle if it benefits me. Mm-hmm. Nothing Dr. Umar doing is being done to benefit me. I would like it to benefit my girls, but it might not even benefit right. my daughters. They might not even be around when we see this thing fall, but I know it's going to benefit my people. I am because we are. And we got to get back to that. I am because we are. Frederick Douglass didn't know that I would be fighting his fight right now. He didn't know I would be fighting his fight over 100 years after he died. Marcus Garvey didn't know I would be fighting his fight right now. He didn't know that. He didn't know I was coming. But because of his, his example, it inspired me to act. So we cannot get caught up in this, well, it might not fall. It might not work. You don't make that decision. The final decision is left up to God. We got to do the work, but God determines the outcome. Put your faith in the most high, but put your best foot forward. We have to not quit. We got to stand up and we got to fight and we got to motivate our children that they are worth fighting for. Because when we don't fight, what does that tell our kids? They feel they're not worth being fought for. Ain't nobody fighting for me. Ain't nobody fighting to keep me out of special. Ain't nobody fighting to give me no job. Ain't nobody fighting to teach me who I am. So by doing nothing, by doing nothing, we send our children a very, very dangerous message that they are not worth being fought for. I got to say this. Um, on behalf of 98.4 FM, WPR, and you know we don't support everything that goes on in today's world, but as you can see, you can go on our website and you will see Dr. Umar Johnson's website link embedded into our codes. So you can always go to there, go there and get to his site, if anything. And um, I also want to say that if there's any way I can actually help teach in the school, when the school is set and done and everything is a go, I will be proud to join the staff of the school uh thank you my brother thank you please get me that resume i also want to come up to jeanette pennsylvania i never even heard of jeanette pennsylvania oh <laughs> this place here i mean you got like, black folks up there there are black <laughs> folks in here but like i'm about to say now these black folks need a wake-up call for real there's places like uniontown pennsylvania other places like that i've been to since i moved to pennsylvania and the black people are lost I mean, really lost. Well, let's make something happen. I want to come up there. I love going to new places, man. So I love new places. So we can set something up, maybe do a two, three-day weekend where we hit Uniontown, hit Jeanette, hit one of the other little milk and crannies. One thing that I try to do, you know, and I'm probably not the only one, but I know I'm one of the few, as I've been told I've one of the few. I like to go to cities that other scholars won't go to. Like a lot of scholars ain't going to go to the little milk and crannies because they don't see no money in it. Because a lot of them only speak because they want to get paid. So they're not going to go to a little small outback town. First question they're going to ask, how many black folks are there? How many likely to come to the event? How much money can I make? I'm not into that. 
You know, I've spoken in places. I've been the only scholar to speak in certain towns in this country because they were so small, so backwoodish, you know, so quote unquote ass backwards that the average scholar didn't see any, you know, need to go because there was no money in it. They only do big cities. Okay, I, I do every little milk and cranny. Dr. Umar didn't been down the back roads around the corner from the old gas station. That's what I do because I believe we got to reach all black folks. So I never want nobody, even your listening audience, to feel, you know, we want to reach out to Dr. Umar, have him come, but he ain't going to come here because it's only like 100 black folks who live in this town. I don't care. It's not the quantity. It's the quality. It's the quality. If I can speak to a, and I've spoken to audiences of thousands, but if I can speak to a room of 10 people, and I know that five of those ten people are going to take my message and put it into place and go out there and start helping families and children and build the community, then that was that that ten person lecture was far more important than going to a five thousand seat church and doing a phenomenal lecture and everybody walk out and go right back to the way they was living. So I I've been gotten over the quantity argument. I've been gotten right. over it. You know, I speak to all sizes, you know, I have the largest audiences in the conscious community, you know, but that don't mean nothing no more. Who's going to do the work? And if somebody, and if I knew beforehand that if you go to this little outback town, there's only going to be 10 black people there, but they will take that work and they will build that parent association. And you come back in five years, they will have their own little baby black Wall Street growing. But if you go over here, you're going to have 10,000 people, but ain't none of them going to do nothing with you. I don't speak to be heard, y'all. I do not speak to be heard. I speak so that the information can be taken and used and put into place. The the end result of my message is movement and action, Basically. not emotionalism. I'm not no Solid. pastor, no pre. Exactly. It's about the action. About so if I know that speaking is isn't going to bring forth action. I don't need to speak. That's a place I don't need to come to because it's about the work right now. It ain't about the oratory. It's about the work. Right. It's all about results, you know. Results. Sustained, measurable outcomes, period. Sustained, yep. measurable outcomes. That's the first thing I ask people. First thing I ask anybody, Jesse Jackson, show me your sustained, measurable outcomes. Minister Farrakhan, show me your sustained, measurable outcomes. Al Sharpton, show me your sustained, measurable outcomes. Cornell. Okay, and I'm not putting the minister in the same boat with the others, but I'm just trying to show that any black leader, organizer, spokesperson, at the end of the day, you're going to be judged by your sustained measurable outcome. Frederick Douglass, what were your sustained measurable outcomes? Well, I was a chief fighter for the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment. Dr. King, what were your sustained measurable outcomes? Well, I am the primary reason we got the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Bill. You see, sustain, it's all about sustain. Marcus Garvey, what were your sustained measurable outcomes? Well, I'm the reason Africa is free today. I laid down the ideological foundation for the inner white rule on the continent. Sustained measurable outcomes. That's what it's all about. Not how good you can speak, but how well you can impact and motivate your people to make a change. True. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so. Um... Also, <laughs> if I could quickly. Go ahead. Cincinnati next Friday. Friday, September the 25th, I will be in Cincinnati, Ohio. Saturday, September the 26th, I will be in Roselle, New Jersey. Saturday, October 3rd, St. Louis. Sunday, October 4th, Harlem. Monday, October 5th, we will be organizing the Parent Association in Montclair, New Jersey. Tuesday the 6th, we will be organizing the Parent Association in Newark, New Jersey. Wednesday the 7th, Brooklyn, New York City, and then I go over to Manchester, England, October 15th to the 18th. I will be keynoting the 70th anniversary of the 1945 Fifth Pan-African Congress, and then I go to South Africa, October the 21st to November 7th, for my speaking tour of South Africa, and then I come back. I have Raleigh, North Carolina, at the St. Augustine's College on the 14th of November. I also left out next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, I will be speaking for the first time in Orangeburg, South Carolina, at the South Carolina State uh, University in Orangeburg, Tuesday the 29th, I believe the date is. I will be at Long California State, Long Beach, uh, November the 21st for their Black Consciousness Conference, and I will be debuting in Killeen, Texas. Killeen, K-I-L-L-E-E-N, Killeen, Texas. Uh, they have a black Natural Black Hair Care Expo. That's Sunday, November the 22nd, 1122. I will be in Houston, Texas, the first day of Kwanzaa. I will be in Atlanta, the third day of Kwanzaa. I will be in Detroit, Michigan, the fifth day of Kwanzaa. And for those who are in the Brooklyn area, because I know a lot of my Brooklynites 
are listening to this interview, make sure y'all show up down there in Brooklyn. You know what I'm saying? Show their support. Show that you want to see change. You know what I'm saying? Within the black society. Definitely show up there in Brooklyn. I mean, turn it out. (laughs) You know what I mean? Just like how y'all go to the club, go to that event and show um, Dr. Umar some love. Show him and let him know that his words were very strong. You know what I mean? That it got y'all off of your behinds and y'all had to come out and see for yourselves. Because like I said, I knew about him uh, the first year I moved to Pennsylvania. I got a chance to see a video which someone gave to me for free when I went back to New York for a visit. And ever since then, I've been following. I've been stuck listening to every video that pops up on YouTube, which I know you said you don't own the the YouTube pages that these videos show up. But I watch every video. Some more than twice. I appreciate that love, my brother. I appreciate that love. I also want people to know they can always get in contact with me. I try to be accessible. Of course, you know, as we continue to move and I continue to grow and build, I won't be as accessible as I've been only because of the sheer volume of people who try to reach out to me. But they can always send me an email through the website or directly, drumarjohnson.com, drumarjohnson at yahoo.com. If you're on Twitter or Instagram, you can uh, send me, uh, you can follow me at Twitter and Instagram, at Dr. Umar Johnson. Uh, You can also inbox me there. But to let folks know, I check my email and my WhatsApp more than anything else. My email and my WhatsApp. So if you don't have WhatsApp, download it. Free text message service uh, from the App Store. Get your WhatsApp. I'm on WhatsApp. and So WhatsApp and email. I don't check my Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook inboxes that much. So if it's something serious, if it's serious, you need to send me an email. A request to speak, that shouldn't be coming by Instagram or Facebook. That should be coming in a formal email. And as I said at the beginning um, of uh, our interview, something's wrong with my iPhone. I can't receive calls and I can't dial out. So you can't call me or text me now anyway. I can't get any text messages or phone calls right now i don't know why but we'll figure that out hopefully oh, so uh, soon that's but, why um, when i sent you yes, the text always accessible always accessible i was about to say that's why when i sent you the text earlier i didn't get no reply back and that's what made me a little nervous as far as this interview yeah, was man. concerned i've never, never seen this happen to anybody where they cannot dial out or receive calls on their phone i got my internet that's why i was able to get on whatsapp you know i can check my email check internet i can get on facebook twitter but i cannot receive calls and I cannot make calls, and I don't understand. They do have an Apple store uh, not too far from Rochester. I might got to ride out to the Apple store tomorrow and see if they can do something. I was at the Sprint store. They could do nothing with the phone. So maybe the Apple store can do something because this is crazy. I got all my bars. I got the reception. But when I hit that, 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 that green phone to dial, nothing happens. So mm. Interesting. Yeah, I got to handle yeah. that out there in Rochester. Stop playing with the services. <laughs> well, on behalf of the station, me and Miss Marcy, we would like to thank you for joining in yes. and and giving us your time. You know what I mean? Oh, no problem. The honor's always mine. You know, whenever, whenever. And also for that 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 Jeanette piece, I'm serious about that. So uh, we'll probably have to do it during the week. You know, weekday evening. You know, maybe two nights. Let me know how y'all want to make that happen. Okay. And um, I wouldn't mind coming up there. Like I said, it's not quantity, it's quality. I know we won't get a lot, but then you never know. I was in Providence. I said, this is Providence, Rhode Island, first day of the NFL season. You know, our black folks love football. So I didn't think nobody would come out. I thought we might have 50 people, you know, to 100 people. You know, small New England state, not a lot of consciousness. I walked into the place was jam-packed. So you never know what you get. You never know what you get. All, All right. we can do is do the work, lead the results to God. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, well, thank you for calling in, man. And like I said, for those who want to relive this moment with us, we will upload the interview on iTunes and on iHeartRadio. So y'all be able to, for those who are following us on any of those apps, y'all be able to listen to this interview no later than the morning. So, (laughs) you know, and we will put it up on YouTube also. So we're going to support Dr. Umar Johnson to the fullest of our extent. And whatever we can do afterwards, all you have to do is let us know, my brother. Appreciate it, my brother. Y'all be blessed. Stay in touch. Make sure y'all add me on WhatsApp, you know, so we can communicate that way because I don't know how long this text message and and phone reception issue going to be. But email and WhatsApp, y'all could definitely get with me. Yeah, I'm going to download that app in a little bit, too. (laughs) Believe that. I appreciate that. 
All right, man. Thanks a lot, man. All right, y'all. Be blessed. No you doubt. too. All man. right. Bye bye. Yeah, man, you already know what it is. It's your boy DJ Trap Jesus with the homegirl, Miss Marcy. Hey. And we have officially got the Dr. Umar interview wrapped. And we would like to thank everybody who tuned in, you know, was patient with us because, you know, it, it, we, I think we started a little late. But we got it in there. And like I said, you can get us on Twitter, Facebook. What's your Facebook and your Twitter? Mine is Miss Marcy. My Facebook is Miss Marcy. My Twitter is at Miss Marcy twenty three. And mine, as you already know, is DJ Trap Jesus all around the board. You know, and you can follow the station, same name, all around the board, WPR ninety eight point four FM. And like I said, keep it locked. You know, we are like the exclusive station for all this. And um, it is what it is, man. <laughs> There's nothing else we can say now. Look, y'all right. just got a whole hour and forty something minutes of minutes, in, yep. like knowledge. It was a good conversation. Yeah, it was. Yeah, real good. And you know, it took us, and I meant to tell him, it took us like we prepared for this interview since oh. like last weekend. We, yeah, yeah. Ever since I got the green light for this interview, which was like almost two weeks now, we've been preparing mm-hmm. for this. And we don't prepare for any old interviews. And you can check me out tomorrow, 6 o'clock, for the Compton Carter interview. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, we we really put it in. Shout outs to Diggy. I saw your tweet, Diggy. (laughs) He was like, yo, this is some real shit right here. (laughs) Shout out out to K-Town Chris. I saw her tweet. Yeah, I saw her on the retweet. And shout outs to Amisha. I saw you on the tweet. You know what I mean? Everybody that support the station, we we like to thank y'all and, you know, Basically, just keep rocking with us because you're going to get more of this exclusiveness as the years come. And in 2016, you already know we got we got some surprises. And like I said, you can go to the GoFundMe account right now. I mean, I meant to promote this earlier. And we have a building fund because, like I said, I didn't build WPR just for my personal use. I build this to for people to have jobs. You know what I'm saying? So we put in, we put the put together the building fund so we're trying to reach a target of thirty thousand dollars we can buy the church next door there's an abandoned church next door we will use to for the station you know what i'm saying so like i mean if thirty thousand people can donate a, a dollar we will reach our target quicker than everybody trying to donate a lump sum you know what i mean so just show your support. The link is on my Facebook. Is on. I put it out on Twitter if you need it. And for those who already started donating, thank you from the bottom of my, of my heart. You know what I'm saying? This is real madness going on in this world, and we need real people to stand up and fight for our culture, fight for our race. And I am for one, me and Miss Marcy, and everybody here at WPR is standing up for our race. Black-owned businesses support that. And there it is, man. Yep. You already know. So WPR 98.4 FM, we are out of here. Uh, tune in for the reggae show at 8 and tune in for Midnight Love tonight at midnight. I don't even know why I had to say that. Oh, again. oh and y'all, don't miss, don't, uh, don't forget oh, yeah. to tune in to Miss Marcy's show tomorrow at 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Y'all already know, TGI Friday, we're going to have it lit tomorrow, so... Just keep it rock. Kruger Vision, 1 p.m., the top 10 songs of the day at 3. Throwback. And for those who missed the throwback edition today, we had the um, the um, New Jack Swing era. So tomorrow we might do a soundtrack era. You never know. You know, we always do things at the last moment when it comes yeah. to the throwback hours. So you never depending know. What on, th- depending on how we feel. Yeah. <laughs> So basically, just keep us locked, man. Like I said, thanks for tuning in. We are out of here like last year. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> Let's go, people.